Great, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Garish. And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks again for inviting me uh, to present today. Um, sorry, I can't be there in person. Uh, yeah, it turns out that Perth is a fair way away from uh, from Sydney. Um, but yeah, like I said before, uh, a bit earlier, I'll be visiting uh, UWA for the uh, annual PhD conference in November. So yeah, hopefully I'll get the opportunity to meet some of you um, in person then. Uh, I guess, yeah, before I begin, I, you know, am obliged to say that any views expressed uh, in this presentation don't necessarily reflect the views of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, you know, that said, it's kind of hard to imagine the RBA having views on the issue of, you know, normalisation in structural vector order regressions. Um, so it seems kind of unlikely. Um, yeah, so this is work in progress. Uh, feedback's very much welcome. Um, happy to take questions as I go along. Like, please interrupt me if anything's unclear or you want to ask a question. Uh, I'll just, yeah, maybe try to give a sense of at a very high level what this work is about before I dive in. Um, so it really, it's all about trying to understand what it is that we can learn about the responses to so-called unit shocks. Um, and so by that, for example, I mean, say a monetary policy shock that raises the federal funds rate or the cash rate by 100 basis points on impact. Uh, in structural vector order regressions that are set identified. Uh, and so by set identified, you know, I mean like, for example, I'm um, using sign restrictions, uh, but I'll, I'll be a bit more uh, concrete about uh, what I mean by all of this um, as we go along. Okay, so just to begin, I guess I can give some background and um, provide some motivation for the work. Um, so as you're probably aware, it's really common these days to estimate the effects of macroeconomic shocks using structural VARs that are set identified. So like I said, using sign restrictions, for example, uh, but not just sign restrictions, you know, maybe we're imposing some zero restrictions, but you know, the zero restrictions that we're imposing are insufficient to point identify the parameters, parameters of interest. Um, I guess, yeah, if you're unfamiliar with the term set identified, what does it mean? Well, it just means that the identifying restrictions aren't sufficient to pin down a unique value of the model structural parameters and you know, functions of those parameters like impulse responses. Um, so in structural VARs that, that are set identified, um, the typical assumption is that the structural shocks have unit standard deviation. And so what this means is that the impulse responses that we obtain from these models are with respect to standard deviation shocks. So if, if you've ever seen um, someone you know, estimate a set identified, like a sign restricted um, structural VAR and present impulse responses to standard deviation shock, Typically what you'll see, say it's a monetary structural VAR, you'll see the you know, uh, monetary policy tool like the cash rate or the federal funds rate, you know, having some response on impact, but there'll be a range of responses on impact. So the restrictions aren't pinning down the impact response of the say policy instrument. Um, and so what this means then are that the impulse responses of all the other variables that we're obtaining, like for example, the impulse responses of output or inflation, they're with respect to you know, different sized shocks in some sense. Um, so you know this distribution of responses we get, it's in a sense confounding um, the responses to different size shocks. Um, and so what that kind of means is that in a lot of circumstances, the um, impulse responses we get under this normalization that the shocks have unit standard deviation aren't really or necessarily the impulse responses that are that are of interest to us to answer the economic questions um, you know, that, that we're trying to answer. Um, and so what we arguably should be interested in, in a lot of contexts, are the impulse responses to so-called unit shocks. And so going back to the example I mentioned on the, the title slide, an example of that would be, okay, um, what's the effect of a 100 basis point shock to the federal funds rate or a 25 basis point shock to the cash rate or, or something like that? You know, these are the kind of questions as policymakers that we are you know, typically posing and that we want to answer. Um, again, in this monetary policy example, you know, why, why are we trying to estimate the effects of monetary policy? Because we want to understand what happens when we move the cash rate or you know, the policy rate by a particular um, amount. Um, and so the impulse responses to standard deviation shocks, they don't answer that question. We need the impulse responses to a fixed size shock or a unit shock. Um, this, this point isn't new, so I, I'm not you know, the first to, to make this, this argument. Um, so for example, there's a couple of papers by Stock and Watson where they, uh, you know, point out and argue that the impulse responses to unit shocks are usually 
in many cases, what we actually should be interested in. Um, and they explain that you can obtain those impulse responses under an alternative normalization called the unit effect normalization. So that's just normalizing the impulse response of some variable to unity. Um, so for example, normalizing the impulse response of you know, the federal funds rate to a monetary policy shock to be one unit on impact. That's an example of the unit effect normalization. Uh, now, if you're doing standard Bayesian inference, and so by standard, I mean, you know, often what people do, yeah, they'll- Sorry to interrupt. I guess there's a question by Michael McClough. Uh, yep, yeah, sure. Thanks. I can't actually see Zoom hands. So um, yeah, I appreciate you calling that out for me. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Just a, a query. Um, obviously, 100 basis points when you've got 1% interest rates is not the same as when you have 100 basis points when you have 8% interest rates. I mean, it's a- it's a, a, a measure of absolute measure of change, whereas presumably the effect of a policy change of 100 basis points is quite different from a, when the, you know, the cash rates at 2% versus a cash rate at 8 or 10%. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in these typical structural vector order regressions, uh, you know, we're working under a linearity assumption. So we are assuming that, you know, 100 basis points from one level to another is the same as from some other starting level to another. Um, so that's, you know, a main, maintained assumption in these linear models. I think, yeah, I have sympathy for the idea that maybe that assumption isn't uh, necessarily correct. Um, and yeah, maybe it can be thought of more of a, an approximation, um, but yeah, the model, the models that I'm talking about here, they're all linear. And so they will be imposing um, that assumption, which is, you know, the kind of standard framework in which a lot of these uh, uh, models um, are set out in. Uh, but, you know, then there's also a big literature about, you know, nonlinear structural VARs and, 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 and that kind of thing where you could allow for, uh, I guess, the effects to be uh, state dependent or path dependent or the like, uh, but I don't have anything to say about uh, those models in this paper. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, so if, if you're doing standard Bayesian inference, um, so, you know, the sort of standard approach you would do is you impose a, um, you know, a prior over say your reduced form parameters. So it might be like a Minnesota prior or, or the like, if you're familiar with that. And then you impose a uniform prior over a particular a particular matrix um, in the model. So that's a kind of standard Bayesian approach to inference. Uh, if you're doing that, it's really very straightforward to swap between the two normalizations. So imagine I've uh, you know kind of drawn from my posterior distribution of impulse responses to a standard deviation shock. So I've got all these impulse responses to standard deviation shocks. And then what I want to do is normalize those impulse responses such that a particular impulse response is unity. Um, so again, going back to the example of a monetary uh, structural VAR, say I've got some impulse responses to uh, of output to the monetary policy shock. In order to get the impulse responses of output to a unit monetary policy shock, you'd basically just then divide all the impulse responses by the impact response of the policy rate to that shock. And so then that impact response is normalized to unity, and then all the uh, impulse responses are res with respect to a uh, unit unit monetary policy shock. So that's really straightforward when you're doing standard Bayesian inference, uh, or if you're in a point identified setting. Um, however, there are problems. Um, I, I almost said well known, but actually I guess they're not that well known. Um, there's problems with conducting uh, standard Bayesian inference in set identified models, which is the setting that we're focusing on here. So in particular, because the model is set identified, that means the likelihood function is flat in some dimension. Uh, and then that implies that our posterior distribution is just going to be proportional to the prior distribution in some sense. Uh, and so then you might worry, well, if I change the prior distribution a little, then I'm changing the posterior distribution one for one. And I might be worried that the results that I'm obtaining are sensitive to that change in prior. So there's this problem of uh, you know, posterior sensitivity to the choice of prior. Um, now, there are approaches out there that abstract from or elim eliminate that problem. So, for example, we could do frequentist inference in a set identified model, and then there's no prior, like, so the prior, prior, doesn't, prior doesn't play a role. Um, there's no problem of posterior sensitivity. And there are other approaches too, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but, you know, the properties of those approaches are unclear when we're interested in this impulse response to a unit shock as the parameter of interest. Typically, these other approaches focus on the impulse responses to a standard deviation shock. Uh, 
Matt, a quick question. So yeah. um, just from my understanding, um, so again, there are many different ways you can, you know, achieve identification in SVAR yeah. models, right? So for example, one case is where you think about uh, imposing the short run and long run restrictions, obviously sign restrictions are one. So my understanding is that you, you don't necessarily have this trade-off between uh, you know, unit normalization versus standard deviation in say, for example, identification that is through long and short-term restrictions. It's only in sign restrictions that you're saying that you have this issue, right? So <clears throat> if, if the short run and the long run restrictions that you're imposing are sufficient to achieve point identification, then mm -hmm. you, know, you still get to choose whether the impulse responses are to a unit or a standard deviation shock. But either way, you can always renormalize very straightforwardly and swap between the two. Correct. Um, so it's, yeah, there's not a huge issue there. there. There are some subtleties because, well, if the thing you're normalizing by, say you're doing frequentist inference in this case, and the like sampling distribution of the MLE of the impulse response that you're normalizing by, if that has mass close to zero, then when I renormalize and divide by that, I can get a distribution for the impulse response to a unit shock that might be non-standard, non-normal. And yeah, so there's some issues around that, um, but that's a very different issue to what I'll be talking about here. Um, so that's if you're in the point identified setting. Uh, so there's, a, I guess, another angle to this where you could consider imposing short run or long run restrictions, but not enough of them to actually achieve point identification. I see. Right, so I could still be imposing uh, you know, some zero restrictions, maybe some sign restrictions alongside that. And then I'll be in the set identified um, setting that we're talking about here. Um, and, you know, as we go through the presentation later on, like I'll be allowing for, you know, fairly arbitrary sets of sign and or zero restrictions. Um, so you can consider imposing the kind of restrictions that you're talking about, as long as we're still set identified. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so what do I do in this paper? So um, I, I think there's a, a few contributions that I make. So the first thing I do, and I think um, this is arguably the main result of the paper, is that I show the identified sets for the impulse responses to unit shocks may be unbounded. So let me just explain uh, what I mean by that. So firstly, an identified set, what is that? If you're unfamiliar with it? Well, because these restrictions that I'm focusing on are set identifying, you know, they don't pin down a unique value of the parameters of interest they pin down a set of parameter values, okay? So we impose these restrictions, we get a set of impulse responses rather than a unique impulse response given any value of the reduced form parameters. And what I'm saying here is that if the parameter of interest is the impulse response to a unit shock, those identified sets can be infinite in length. So they can be unbounded. So what that means is that Set identifying restrictions have the potential to be extremely un uninformative about the impulse responses to unit shocks. So, you know, going back to this monetary policy example, which I'll keep coming back to because I am interested in monetary policy, it's possible that given a set of, say, sign restrictions on impulse responses, uh, if we're interested in the effect of a 100 basis point shock to the federal funds rate or the cash rate, those sign restrictions might not tell us anything at all about those impulse responses. So we, we may learn nothing about them, which is, I guess, a kind of a potentially worrying result. Um, but it's not always the case. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in an empirical application um, that this, I guess, does arise, but you know, it's not guaranteed to arise. The second thing I do is I so take this observation that these identified sets may be unbounded, and I discuss some implications of this observation for conducting so-called prior robust Bayesian inference. Um, so I'll be focusing on this approach to inference. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly recent approach proposed in this paper by Rafael Giacomini and Toro Kitagawa um, in Econometrica. So these are a couple of co-authors of mine. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's a nice approach to focus on in this setting. Um, it's a natural approach because it combines sort of features of Bayesian inference with um, basically a, an approach to eliminating this prior sensitivity issue that I um, sort of alluded to or, or spoke a bit about earlier. Um, but you know, a lot of the implications I'm talking about, similar issues will arise in a frequentist setting as well. It's just that 
you know, not many papers in the literature actually do frequentist inference in set identified uh, models. So that's why I'm, I'm going to be focusing on, the, on this, this approach. Um, and basically the takeaway of this discussion uh, is going to be that, you know, there's going to be different, I guess, inferential outputs that we get from this approach. So things like credible intervals, et cetera, um, and whether those credible intervals are bounded or not is basically going to depend on the posterior probability that the identified set itself is unbounded. And I'm going to argue that it's important for us to understand how often the identified set is unbounded so that we can sort of transparently communicate about the informativeness of the restrictions with respect to these impulse responses. Um, so to facilitate that, I uh, discuss how to check for unboundedness of these impulse responses in practice. So I have some you know, theoretical results and uh, I propose some numerical tools for checking for unboundedness. And then I argue, you know, you should use these tools and sort of report the pro posterior probability um, that this unboundedness issue may arise. Uh, and then finally, I have an empirical application that, you know, hopefully convinces you that all of this is worth worrying about. So I'm going to be estimating the effects of a 100 basis point shock to the federal funds rate using some existing um, sets of identifying restrictions from the literature. Uh, and I guess the takeaway from the empirical application is going to be under some fairly influential sets of restrictions in the literature, you cannot rule out the possibility that the identified set is unbounded um, at any value of the model's reduced form parameters, uh, which implies that those identifying restrictions essentially tell you nothing about the impulse responses to a unit shock. Um, but then as we add more and more restrictions, uh, we find that the uh, identified set is unbounded with lower posterior probability. Um, so we can still learn something about these um, impulse responses of interest. So that's kind of the contribution of the paper in, in a nutshell. And you can kind of think of this, I guess, as a bit of a roadmap for how the um, presentation will unfold, um, if you find that useful. Uh, any, any questions before I move on? So just a just a clarification, um, Matt. So basically, if I if I get this right, it's kind of a cautionary tale regarding uh, normalizations, right? Yeah, in a sense, um, I I, I kind of see sort of I guess two or three aspects to it. So one, yeah, you know, one is okay. In some contexts, this is the parameter of interest that we should be looking at this impulse response unit shock. But like I said, I'm not the first to say that. Uh, number two is if that is the thing you're interested in, then you should be worried that the restrictions aren't telling you anything about that parameter. Um, and you'll see a bit later that, you know, in the case where the restrictions don't tell you anything about that parameter, then it's really going to be the prior distribution under the standard Bayesian approach to inference that's driving all of your results. And once you apply techniques that abstract from the prior distribution, like this prior robust Bayesian approach to inference, that's only that's that's when you're going to realize that uh, you know it's just the prior driving everything. Um, and I guess the other thrust is I yeah, I'm gonna argue I think it's important for us just to be very transparent about how informative these restrictions are about the parameters um, that are of interest. Um, and that, and that's really a theme of you know this Geo Committee and Kitagawa paper and a number of other related papers. Um, you know, it's it's all about not letting our results be driven by uh, hidden assumptions that are implicit in a prior that may be somewhat arbitrary. We really want to be clear about where's the information coming from um, on which we're drawing our inferences. I see. Uh, but yeah, there, there certainly is a cautionary challenge. <laughs> Every time you see a paper that uses sign restrictions or the like, you should be asking yourself and the presenter uh, <laughs> these questions, I think. Uh, I'll quickly just mention how this relates to some of the existing literature. Um, so like I said, I'm not the first person to you know, suggest that we should be looking at impulse responses to a unit shock. So there's a paper by Renee, uh, now Fry McKibben and Adrian Pagan. So they make this point in the paper and a couple of papers by Stockham Watson where they really push the idea that we should be looking at um, unit effects. There's a massive literature that uses set identified structural VARs. So, you know, probably starting with uh, Ulig's seminal um, Journal of Monetary Economics paper that introduces sign restrictions on impulse responses. You know, a more recent paper by Arias et al. in the JME that's about combining sign and zero restrictions and algorithms that you can use to do that. 
And then these latter two papers are frequentist approaches to inference instead identified structural VARs. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the stuff I'm going to say, you can imagine it applying quite naturally in a frequentist framework as well, but I'm not going to say a lot about that explicitly. The focus is going to be on this robust Bayesian approach to inference. Um, there's a literature that expresses concerns about the standard Bayesian approach to inference or this uniform prior um, over a particular matrix in, in a particular parameterization of the model. So Baumeister and Hamilton, they have a sequence of papers where they argue against the standard Bayesian approach to inference. Uh, and I'm very sympathetic to the points they make there. Of course, their kind of suggested uh, approach or like answer to this problem is to specify a prior directly over the structural parameters of the model. Um, and you know, if you believe that prior, then you believe the posterior that comes out of that. Um, whereas the approach I'm taking is saying, okay, we're not willing to write down a prior of the structural parameters. We're going to apply an approach that kind of gets rid of the problematic part of the prior. Um, and I'll explain uh, more about what I mean there as we go on. And then finally, this relates very closely to um, this literature on robust Bayesian inference and set identified models, which I've um, contributed to in some way um, with a couple of co-authors. So you know, this paper by Rafaela and Toru in Econometrica, you know, they point out this problem with, which I kind of is, I guess, to some extent, well known before that about inference and set identified models being sensitive to the choice of prior. Um, and then they suggest a general approach to dealing with that, this prior robust Bayesian approach to inference. And then in their paper, they apply that in the context of structural VARs. Um, I have another paper with them where we extend that approach to inference in, you know, so-called proxy structural vector order regressions, which is where you have an external instrument for a shock and you use that to, to point identify um, impulse responses. Um, in that paper, we noted the possibility that the identified set could be unbounded, but we didn't explore that any further or you know, suggest any way to, to really think about that. Um, and so I guess you, in a sense, this, this paper that I'm presenting today kind of pushes that idea um, a bit further. Okay, so what I'm going to do over the next few slides is just talk through the framework in which I'm working. Um, so we're on the same page. Um, so on this slide, I'm just going to talk through, uh, you know, what is a structural VAR and then I'm getting down to a particular parameterization of the model that will be very useful um, for what I'm doing. Okay, so YT is going to be an N by one vector that follows a SRP process. So there's going to be P lags there. So A0, that's an N by N uh, invertible matrix. Um, XT, that's going to be a vector that stacks the relevant lags of the endogenous variables. If you want, that could include um, exogenous variables as well. And then A plus will be the you know, structural coefficients on those lagged variables. Epsilon T, that's a vector of structural shocks. So they're going to be assumed to be normally distributed with zero mean and identity covariance matrix. And so it's this assumption that the covariance matrix is the identity matrix which is the unit standard deviation normalization. So under this normalization, all the impulse responses that you naturally get out of the model are gonna be with respect to standard deviation shocks. So the structural VAR has a reduced form, which I've written down here. Um, so B is just a matrix of reduced form autoregressive coefficients, which are you know, gonna be a function of the underlying structural parameters, A0 and A plus. Uh, UT, that's a vector of reduced form innovations. Um, so they're going to be linear combinations of the underlying structural shocks. I, and I'm going to denote the variance covariance matrix of those innovations by sigma. And then as shorthand, I'm going to represent the parameters of the reduced form by phi. So phi just indexes the reduced form parameters of the model. Uh, so in set identified structural VARs, it's quite convenient to work in an alternative parameterization of the model the so-called orthogonal reduced form. Um, so I've just written that down here. So it kind of looks like the reduced form, except instead of having the reduced form innovations, we represent them as the product of three components. So the last component is the vector of structural shocks. The first component is the lower triangular Cholesky factor of the variance covariance matrix, so sigma subscript TR. And then the, the second component, the middle component, that's an orthonormal matrix Q. So by orthonormal, I mean the columns and rows um, are orthogonal and have unit length. And I'm going to denote the space of N by N orthonormal matrices by this curly O of N. Um, 
and, and I guess, yeah, the identification problem in a structural VAR is, okay, we want to know what the structural parameters are or the impulse responses to functions of those structural parameters. What we can actually estimate are the reduced form parameters. And so it's all about, oh, how do I go from the reduced form parameters to the structural parameters? I need to impose identifying restrictions. Um, and I'll talk about what kind of identifying restrictions I consider in a little bit, maybe on the next slide. <laughs> Not on the next slide, maybe the slide after. Okay, so the parameters of interest in this work are going to be impulse responses. Um, so as I mentioned on the previous slide, if what you're interested in are the impulse responses to standard deviation shocks, you can sort of obtain them fairly straightforwardly from the, from the VAR, in particular from the vector moving average representation of the, the VAR. I won't write down exactly what those impulse responses look like as functions of the parameters, but I'm just going to, as shorthand, denote them with this eta ijh um, notation. So this is going to be the impulse response at horizon h of the ith variable to a shock in the jth variable, and in particular, a standard deviation shock in the jth variable. This impulse response is going to be a function of the reduced form parameters and the orthonormal matrix Q. Now, the like, ultimate parameter of interest in this work is going to be the impulse response to a unit shock, and so I need to define what I mean by that. So the eta tilde is going to represent an impulse response to a unit shock. In particular, uh, this is going to represent the horizon H impulse response of the ith variable to a shock in the first variable that raises the first variable by one unit on impact. So going back to the monetary policy example, um, maybe this is the impulse response of output with respect at some horizon with respect to a monetary policy shock that raises the federal funds rate by one uh, percentage point on impact. And so that's just equal to the ratio of impulse responses to standard deviation shocks. So it's the impulse response at horizon H of the ith variable to a shock in the first variable divided by the impact response of the first variable to the first shock. And so the variable on the denominator here, that's the impulse response that we're normalizing to unity. So I'm going to refer to this as the normalizing impulse response. Okay, any any questions about um, that definition? Because uh, you yeah, know that's going to be important. Uh, no. So just a just a clarificatory question, uh, Matt. So e, in general, uh, in your second row, eta i j h is basically the impulse response at horizon h uh, from a shock to j, but that shock is basically a standard deviation shock, right? So how do you get from there to the definition of the unit shock that you're getting? Because ultimately the, the right-hand side variables are still standard deviation shocks at horizon H and uh, the contemporaneous one, right? So I, yeah. I'm, I'm not able to tie in how exactly, you know, the, the right-hand side becomes a unit shock response at horizon H. So if, if you look at, um, so imagine what eta tilde one, one, zero would be. Mm -hmm. It would just be eta one one h, sorry, eta one one zero over eta one one zero, which is equal to one by definition. So it's in that sense that by defining the unit shock in this way, I'm normalizing the impulse response beyond the denom. So I'm normalizing a particular impulse response to unity. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because by definition, yeah, the impact response of the first variable to the first shock, which is to a unit shock in the first variable, that's going to be one by definition. Um, so yeah, just basically dividing by the impulse response that I want to normalize to one. Um, I guess it's worth making the point that, yeah, even though the way I've sort of defined this here has me normalizing the you know, impact response of a particular variable to unity, you can generalize this if you want to think about normalizing other impulse responses to unity. So in some settings, maybe you want to normalize like a longer horizon impulse response to a certain value. Um, that might be more natural or of greater interest sometimes. But then, yeah, defining things more generally just means you got more subscripts on, um, on this unit um, impulse response. So it just gets a little bit messier. But everything I say um, will apply in that setting as well. Okay. Okay, so 
it's going to be important to uh, to find the concept of an identified set as we go through. Um, so imagine we have some arbitrary set of sign restrictions, uh, and I'm going to denote them generically by this S mapping. So basically, this says, yeah, given some value of the reduced form parameter. Uh, so imagine like a particular draw of the reduced form parameter from its posterior. I have some sign restrictions on some functions of the structural parameters, and those sign restrictions are going to truncate the allowable values for the orthonormal matrix. Um, so yeah, these could be sign restrictions on impulse responses. They could be sign restrictions on structural coefficients, sign restrictions on long run impulse responses, uh, and so on. So it's like a fairly generic set of potential sign restrictions. And we're going to allow for zero restrictions as well. So represented by this F mapping. Um, so these could be you know, short run restrictions, which Karish mentioned earlier. They could be long run restrictions. Um, potentially, they could be restrictions arising from like external instruments or, or proxies. And like. So given some, and sorry, I should note as well, you know, we're going to uh, constrain ourselves to the setting where the zero restrictions aren't sufficient to point identify or over identify anything. So we're staying in the set identified setting. Now, given a set of sign and zero restrictions, that's going to induce or generate an identified set for the orthonormal matrix um, for Q. So the identified set for Q is going to be denoted by this curly Q of phi. And that's just going to be equal to the set of orthonormal matrices such that the identifying re um, restrictions are satisfied. So you can think about before I impose any restrictions at all, this Q matrix, it's just any orthonormal matrix. So it lives in some space. And then I impose sign restrictions and zero restrictions, and that's going to truncate the space in which this orthonormal matrix can live. Um, and then the set of orthonormal matrices that are consistent with those identifying restrictions, that's going to be the identified set for that matrix. Any value of Q within that identified set is going to have the same value of the likelihood function. So it's going to be observationally equivalent. And so then given some identified set for Q, that's going to induce an identified set for whatever parameters are of interest. So for our impulse responses. Um, so the identified set for our impulse responses to standard deviation shocks or our impulse responses to unit shock, that's just going to be the set of values of those impulse responses as Q varies over its identified set. Um, so I guess, imagine, yeah, we're just interested in one particular impulse response uh, because we're in the set identified setting rather than having a single value that's consistent with the reduced form parameters, there's going to be a set of those values, um, which might be an interval, for example. Okay, so that's, I guess, kind of the, the setup and the, the framework. Um, now I was going to talk a little bit about how does this unboundedness problem arise? Um, what's the intuition? Okay, so what I've done here, I've just rewritten the definition of an impulse response to a unit shock. Okay, and so because we have set identifying restrictions, those restrictions are going to generate an identified set for the impulse responses to the standard deviation shocks, so for the numerator, for the denominator. And so straight away, maybe the intuition is, um, is clear. Straight away, you can see that if zero were to lie in the identified set for the denominator, so for the impulse response that we want to normalize to unity, then perhaps we can construct a sequence of values for this parameter Q converging to that point where the impulse response is zero, such that the ratio explodes. And so that implies, you know, the potential of that happening implies that the identified set for this impulse response to a unit shock <coughs> uh, may be unbounded. So maybe the case that the identified set for this guy is, you know, the whole real line, or maybe half the real line if it's sign restricted or not. So that's some, you know, I guess a, a rough intuition for what could happen. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, a, a bit later, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll basically, I've said this could happen. So it might be possible that we can construct a sequence for this parameter such that the thing explodes. Uh, and then I'll show you that that indeed does and can happen in models that we write down. And so a, an implication of this unboundedness or this potential unboundedness is that 
set identifying restrictions may be extremely uninformative about the impulse responses to unit shocks. So we may learn absolutely nothing about uh, these impulse responses from, from set identifying restrictions, um, which is concerning. Okay, so I've said this unboundedness issue could rise. Now I wanna show you that it in fact does arise. Um, firstly, in a very simple example. So I'm going to write down a bivariate model, very simple. Um, and the reason why this is a nice example to use is that you can kind of analytically derive all the identified sets and stuff and show that they're unbounded under some, some sign restrictions. Um, so that, that's, that's the game I'm in. So taking a bivariate model, I'm get, getting rid of the dynamics. So there's no lake terms. I'll just get rid of them. So you see there's no, no lake terms there. Um, the reduced form parameters are just going to be the elements of this, uh, um, the um, lower triangular Cholesky factor of sigma. So there's no order regressive parameters anymore. So in this bivariate example, the space of two by two orthonormal matrices can be represented in the following way. So it's basically the set of uh, rotation matrices and the set of reflection matrices, which are indexed by this scalar parameter theta, uh, which you can think of like an angle an angle of rotation or, I guess, reflection. And so this theta can vary between minus pi and pi. So as theta varies between minus pi and pi, we, we get different uh, Q matrices. And so the nice thing about this example is that given a set of identifying restrictions, that's going to give us a set of values for theta, um, conditional on the reduced form parameters. So it gives us an identified set for theta, and then we can use that to derive the identified set for whatever parameters of interest, so like for an impulse response. So in this example, I'm going to impose two sign restrictions. So firstly, I'm going to impose that the impulse response of the first variable to the first shock on impact is non-negative. So um, again, with respect to standard deviation shocks and the impulse response of the second variable to the first shock on impact is non-positive. So just the two sign restrictions and then see what happens. Okay, so um, in the absence of any restrictions, uh, you can write down what this A0 inverse matrix looks like, which is the matrix of impact impulse responses. You know, it's some, some set of matrices that depend on the reduced form parameters and this data parameter. And so then you can imagine as I impose the sign restrictions on the previous slide, that's gonna constrain the values of theta given the reduced form parameters. Uh, we can also then, based on this definition of um, the impact impulse response matrix, define what a unit shock is in the first variable the impulse response of the second variable to a unit shock in the first variable is. So that's just the ratio of the impulse response of the second variable to the first shock on impact to the um, you know, impulse response that we're normalizing to one. So if you just do that division, you get this expression. So again, it's a function of some reduced form parameters and this theta, theta parameter. So given an identified set for theta, we can derive the identified set for this impulse response. Okay, so what I've presented on this slide are the identified sets for the normalizing impulse response, the guy that appears on the denominator, and then the identified sets for the impulse response of the second variable to a unit shock in the first. Okay, so there's two cases to consider. In the first case, uh, sigma 2, 1, which basically controls the covariances between y1 and y2, that's uh, negative. In the second case, sigma 2, 1 is weakly positive. In the first case, and so the point of looking at these two cases separately, sorry, is that um, you know they give you different results. So it's important to consider them separately. In the first case, the identified set for this normalizing impulse response is some interval with a positive lower bound and a positive upper bound. So importantly, it excludes zero. In the second case, the identified set for this normalizing impulse response includes zero. So the sign restrictions don't rule out the possibility that the first variable does not respond on impact to the first shock. Now the identified set for the impulse response of the second variable to a unit shock, that's this guy here. So again, in the first case, we have some interval, the lower bound is some negative number, but it's finite and the upper bound is zero. So under the sign restrictions, we learn something about that impulse response, assuming the, um, this reduced form parameter is negative. Now in the second case, the identified set is the negative half of the real line. So given that the 
um, you know, covariance between Y1 and Y2 is weakly positive. All we can say about the impulse response of the second variable to a unit shock in the first variable is that it's negative. That's all we can say. But that's assumed by the sign restriction. We actually imposed that already. So we know nothing about um, the impulse response to a unit shock. And so this just goes to illustrate, again, set identifying restrictions can be very, very uninformative about impulse responses to unit shocks. Um, Matt, uh, uh, can you go back and, and show what exactly was the set bounded in the case of when you were, uh, you know, estimating it for standard deviation for eta T1? Yeah. yeah, so I, I haven't presented the, um, oh, sorry, was the set bounded for the impulse responses? Oh, so you're saying for eta T1, is that yes, bounded? Yes. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, that will, that will always be bounded. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, have shown a... you, I haven't shown you what that uh, looks like, but that will okay. always be bounded. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is, I think, an important point to make. So, you know, this unboundedness issue is only an issue that shows up when the impulse response of interest is to a unit shock. Um, yeah, if you're interested in impulse responses to standard deviation shocks, then they're always bounded. Yeah. So, yeah, in a sense, this unboundedness issue is really coming by the coming through due to the fact that you're dividing by something that, you know, whose identified set doesn't rule out zero. Um, uh, so, in the uh, so in the paper, I also have I guess a kind of geometric intuition for this unboundedness problem. Um, but in the interest of time, I might just get past that. Um, yeah, maybe you can maybe just trust me that the uh, identified sets that I wrote down on the previous slide are you know um, correct. But there's a, there's alternative ways to think about this. Um, but yeah, a few remarks on this bivariate example um, before I move on. So yeah, there, there's a few kind of features of this example that you might possibly think, oh, well, you know, you just get this unboundedness problem because of this particular feature. And if you don't have that feature, then it's not an issue. Um, and so I try to hit some of those um, concerns off. So one, I only imposed sign restrictions on the impulse responses to the first shock. And so you might say, well, if you also impose impulse responses on sorry, sign restrictions on the impulse responses to the second shock, which seems like it would be very natural in this very small system. You know, you could think about a supply and demand system. It's kind of obvious what restrictions you'd want to put on all the impulse responses. Then maybe this unboundedness problem disappears. And so in the paper, I do that. And you can see that the um, this unbounded identified set still arises um, in, in the same cases as, as um, in the example I showed you. So it's, that, doesn't, that doesn't save you. Uh, the other issue, you might say, well, you know, you're imposing these sign restrictions with weak inequality. So kind of by definition, you're not ruling out the possibility that the impulse response of the, like the normalizing impulse response identified set includes zero. What if you impose like a strict inequality instead? Um, but then you, but basically in that case, instead of having identified sets that are closed intervals, they're open intervals, and you can still think about constructing a sequence of parameter values that you know in the limit approaches zero, and so you still get this unboundedness issue. So um, imposing strict inequalities doesn't really help you either. And then finally, you could say, well, you know, you're constructing this impulse response to a unit shock as the ratio of impulse responses to standard deviation shocks, and it's really the fact that you're dealing with a ratio that's causing this unboundedness problem. Um, and so instead of doing that, why don't you actually just write down a parameterization of the model that embeds the unit effect normalization, and then you won't have this unboundedness problem. And so I, um, I show that that doesn't sort of save you either. Um, so just to quickly give you a, an outline of that. Um, so here I've taken the same bivariate model, but I've written down an alternative parameterization that embeds the unit effect normalization. So we've got this H matrix, the coefficient matrix on epsilon T, the shocks, and I've, normalized the diagonal to one to begin with. So, you know, uh, we've got our unit effect normalization already, a one unit shock in epsilon T, sorry, a one unit shock in the first variable is gonna raise the first variable by one unit on impact by definition. Um, and then because we're normalizing something to one, it means we can't normalize the variances of the structural shocks to one anymore. 
So we need to allow them to just be some, you know, some flexible um, parameters to represent by omega. And so then what you can basically do is, you know, write down a system of equations linking the reduced form parameters to these underlying structural parameters, these H's and these omegas. Um, and then you can solve that system of equations um, for H21, which is the impulse response of the second variable to a shock in the first variable that raises the first variable by one unit. You can solve for that parameter as a function of um, H12, which is inside the impulse response. <clears throat> That's a quadratic system of equations. So there's going to be two solutions. I plot them here. So um, when sigma 2, 1 is less than zero, um, this is the kind of set of solutions that we get. So I've got H1, 2 on the uh, horizontal, H2, 1 on the vertical. Um, this curve combined with that curve is one set of solutions. This curve combined with that curve is another set of solutions. And then given the same kind of sign restrictions that I imposed before, the identified set is going to be the set of solutions that respect the sign restrictions. So this red part of the curve. So again, in this case where sigma 2, 1 is less than zero, um, the identified set for H2, 1 is going to be bounded again. This kind of asymptotes to some finite. So H2, 1 asymptotes to like some finite um, and negative value as H1, 2 goes to infinity. But when sigma 2, 1 is weakly positive, the identified set for H21 remains unbounded. So you can see um, <coughs> the values of H21 shoot off to minus infinity as H12 approaches some, some value. Um, so doing things in this alternative parameterization also doesn't save you from this unboundedness problem, but it's still nice to work. It's nice to work in this orthogonal reduced form and to find things as ratios because then we can utilize a bunch of the existing machinery for. Um, you know, conducting inference and computing identified sets that already exist out there. Okay, so, so far what I've done, I've shown you that identified sets can be unbounded um, in a simple example. Um, and then in the paper, I talked through, well, what does this mean for conducting robust Bayesian inference with a little bit of discussion about what it means for conducting frequentist inference. Um, so let me talk through what robust Bayesian inference is, uh, and then I'll talk about how this unboundedness problem kind of affects that approach. Okay, so imagine that we've written down some prior distribution for the set of parameters in the orthogonal reduced form. So call it pi theta. We can always decompose that prior distribution into two components. So the first component is uh, a prior distribution over the reduced form parameters. The second component is a conditional prior for Q given phi. Now the standard Bayesian approach to inference would be, I put a prior on phi, like maybe some Minnesota or something, and then I use a uniform prior for Q given phi. Now, because Q doesn't appear in the likelihood, it means the likelihood function is flat with respect to Q. Once we fix phi, that means that this part of the prior is never going to be updated by the data. So this part gets up updated. This part doesn't get updated because Q doesn't appear in the likelihood. So then you might worry, well, if I change the prior for Q given phi a bit, I'm going to be changing the posterior as well. And so maybe the conclusions that I draw my posterior inferences might be sensitive to changes in the prior. And so, yeah, that, that's a problem that's been known for a long time. And so in this econometric paper, Shukamini Kitagawa, they propose a solution to that problem. So what they say is, well, rather than having a single prior for Q given phi, let's consider the class of all priors for Q given phi that are consistent with the restrictions, the identifying restrictions, in the sense that they put probability one on the identified set, so now instead of having a single conditional prior, I've got a class of priors. For every prior in that class, I can combine that with the posterior for the reduced form parameters. And that's going to give me a posterior distribution for the um, full set of parameters. So this capital pi of phi, uh, sorry, of theta. So I've got a class of posteriors for the structural parameters, and that's going to indu induce a class of posteriors for whatever parameters are of interest. So our impulse responses. And so then they suggest ways to summarize that class of posteriors. So for example, rather than having a single posterior mean, I'm now gonna have a set of posterior means because I have a class of um, class of posteriors. So if I have a scalar you know, parameter of interest, like an impulse response, rather than having a posterior mean being a point, it's gonna be an interval. And that interval is gonna contain every possible posterior mean that you could obtain given this class of priors. And you can think about setting up you know, 
or, con or constructing um, classes of, uh, or sorry, sets of posterior quantiles. So rather than having a median, I have a set of posterior medians. Um, there's like a, you know, robust Bayesian analog of a credible interval, etc. So there's different ways to summarize this class of posteriors. Uh, and I guess an important point here is that, you know, we don't actually need to write down this whole class of priors and derive the posterior, et cetera. Basically, all we need to do to summarize this class of posteriors is compute the bounds of the identified set for the parameter of interest. So we get posterior distributions for those bounds, lower and upper bound. And then all these summary statistics can be computed from those posterior distributions of the bounds. And and thinking through that a little bit, um, which I do in the paper, uh, basically then whether those summaries of the class of posteriors will be bounded is going to depend on the posterior probability that the identified set itself is bounded. So imagine, okay, we're constructing a set of posterior medians that has lower bound equal to the posterior mean of the lower bound of the identified set and similarly for the upper bound. If the identified set is unbounded with positive posterior probability, then I'm averaging over something that's infinite in length. And so then the average is also going to be infinite in length. So straight away, unboundedness of the identified set is going to bleed into unboundedness of the set of posterior uh, means. And then we can think also about, well, how does it affect the um, sets of posterior quantiles and credible intervals? So in the context of the bivariate example, I talk, I spend some time um, sort of thinking about this in, in a very simple setting. Um, I might just skip over the detail here, but the important point is if we know how often the identified set is bounded or unbounded, then that's going to tell us which inferential outputs, which summaries of the class of posteriors are going to be bounded or unbounded as well. And therefore, on that basis, I argue it's very important to understand to compute and to report um, you know, some measure of how often or with what probability these identified sets are, are bounded or guaranteed to be bounded. Because that's going to be really important for understanding how informative the restrictions are. And so to that end, I developed some tools, um, some results and tools that help us to do that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> So firstly, the first thing I note is that in order for the identified set to be unbounded, it's necessary for zero to lie within the identified set for the impulse response that we're normalizing to one. Um, and the intuition is obvious, right? If zero doesn't lie within the identified set for the denominator, then I can't possibly construct a sequence of parameters converging to zero such that the, sorry, so that the denominator converges to zero and the ratio explodes, it just can't be done. So that's a, that's a necessary condition. For, unbound, for unboundedness. But in the paper, I talk about why it's not also sufficient. So it could be possible that zero lies within this identified set, but the identified set for the impulse response to a unit shock remains bounded. And I, I show this by basically writing down an example where, where that occurs. So it's, it's a necessary condition. I then derive a sufficient condition for zero to lie within the identified set for this normalizing impulse response. So basically, if the number of sign and zero restrictions is less than or equal to the number of variables in the VAR, then zero always lies within the identified set for the normalizing impulse response. So it, uh, I guess a, a way to describe this um, is that if I have sort of an insufficient number of restrictions or relatively few restrictions, then I can never rule out the possibility that you know, the first variable doesn't respond on impact to the first shock in which case I should be worried about the potential for the identified set for the impulse response to a unit shock to be unbounded. Um, a couple of remarks, I guess. So um, this condition that I've you know, just outlined, it only applies when there's restrictions on a single column of Q, but it turns out that's the case in many applications. So I argue it's fairly relevant empirically. Um, and although, you know, so we have to have a very small number of restrictions here. Um, say we have like a six variable VAR, then we can't, we need to have fewer than six restrictions in order for this condition to apply. And maybe you say, well, that's unlikely because people usually impose restrictions on dynamic impulse responses. So I very easily end up with enough restrictions to invalidate this condition. Um, but I can point to a number of papers where um, 
you know, they don't impose these dynamic conditions, um, sign restrictions, and this sufficient condition applies. Matt, so uh, is it possible that you your you know ETA one one zero it doesn't have zero in it, uh, but it in itself is unbounded. Uh, but then your uh, you know um, identified set for the unit shock is bounded itself. Sorry, I use. I didn't quite get the first bit of that. So you're saying, is it possible let's say, for zero? Let's say not you to... don't have zero. Let's say you don't have a zero in eta one one zero, and and yeah. the set itself goes on to you know unbounded values, say in the positive half of the real line. For, and for then, the normalizing impulse response. So yes, yeah. The, so the impulse responses to a standard deviation shock, including the normalizing impulse response, they'll always be bounded. Oh, they'll always be bounded. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They'll always be bounded. Yeah. Um, okay. 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 Yeah. Yes, you, you said that before as well. Okay. Mm. That's right. Okay. Um, so in, in the case when this sufficient condition isn't satisfied, so if we have restrictions on multiple columns of Q, or if we have more restrictions than um, variables in the VAR, then it could be the case that the identified set for the normalizing impulse response includes zero, or maybe it doesn't. Um, so I provide some uh, basically numerical tools in order to assess that, to check that. So I won't go into detail about that unless people are interested. Um, and then, so ultimately what I say is that, okay, ideally what we would like to know is the posterior probability that the identified set is unbounded, right? But what, what I can give you instead is the posterior probability that zero is included within the identified set for the normalizing impulse response. And like I said, that doesn't necessarily map always into the identified set for the impulse response to a unit shock being unbounded. Uh, but it tells us, you know, which inferential outputs are guaranteed to be bounded. Um, so we can kind of get a, I guess, a, a lower bound on how severe this unboundedness problem might, might be. Um, and then we can always go and try to numerically approximate the bounds of the identified set for the impulse responses to a unit shock. And in practice, if they're like bonkers large, then we'd suspect that those um, identified sets are in fact unbound. Uh, so I, yeah, I have a geometric illustration, I guess, of how this sufficient condition works, but um, because I didn't go into detail about this geometric illustration before, I'll just skip over that. Uh, of course, after the presentation, if anyone's really interested or curious about this, I'm happy to talk through it. Okay, so I'll spend the rest of the presentation just talking through an empirical application and hopefully convincing you that this actually matters. Uh, and maybe also, if, yeah, if you are a little bit lost because I haven't explained things uh, clearly enough, then hopefully the empirical application uh, makes some things um, clearer. Okay, so the empirical application is all about estimating the effects of US monetary policy. So in particular, trying to answer the question, what's the effect of a 100 basis point federal funds rate shock? Or in I guess in other words, what's the effect of a monetary policy shock that raises the federal funds rate by 100 basis points on impact? Um, so the model and identifying restrictions are taken from existing papers. Um, so from Ulig's seminal you know, JME paper, by this paper by Arias, Kildara, and Rubia Ramirez in the JME. Um, and I've left off, I actually have a third um, set of identifying restrictions as well from a paper by Antolin Diaz and Rubia Ramirez um, in the AER in 2018. Um, so basically all those papers, they estimate, or they tend to estimate um, the impulse responses to a standard deviation monetary policy shock, and they apply standard Bayesian inferential techniques. So their results may be sensitive to the choice of prior. And so I have a different impulse response of interest, this unit impulse response, and I apply robust Bayesian methods. So we can really see how informative the identifying restrictions are. Okay, so the model um, includes six variables, the federal funds rate, uh, real GDP, the GDP deflator, the commodity price index, total reserves and non-borrowed reserves. Um, so this is yeah, basically the model employed by Christiana Eichenbaum and Evans in their you know, seminal, seminal papers as well. Uh, the data are monthly, um, we run from January 1965 to November 2007, um, and I specify Following these papers, I put just a diffuse prior over the reduced form parameters. Um, so it's just like a non-informative prior over, over the reduced form parameters. Okay, <clears throat> so to begin with, I'm going to consider the identifying restrictions from the paper by Arias et al. Uh, 
So they describe their restrictions as restrictions on the systematic component of monetary policy. And so the basic gist of their approach is that they interpret the structural equation for the federal funds rate as a monetary policy reaction function. So you could think of it like a Taylor rule. And then they impose sign and zero restrictions on the coefficients of that reaction function to be consistent with you know, the kind of standard, standard Taylor rules that we would write down in new Keynesian models. So in particular, they impose that uh, the two measures of reserves don't enter the monetary policy reaction function. So in other words, the Federal Reserve does not move the federal funds rate in response to changes in reserves. So that's a couple of zero restrictions on um, some structural coefficients. They impose that the federal funds rate is not decreased in response to higher output or prices. So they would argue that that's consistent with the kind of Taylor rules that we would write down in New Keynesian models. So that's a couple of sign restrictions on structural coefficients. And they impose that the federal funds rate doesn't decrease in response to a positive monetary policy shock, which seems fairly natural. Right? We're looking at a shock that raises the federal funds rate, or at least doesn't uh, decrease the federal funds rate on impact. Plus, there's also a sign normalization on a particular structural parameter. I won't, I won't go into detail on, on what that is. So if we count up the identifying restrictions, there's four sign restrictions and two zero restrictions. Um, so if I did my math right, that's six restrictions in total, which is equal to the number of uh, variables in the VAR. So that means that the sufficient condition that I talked you through before applies, it's satisfied, and the impact response of the federal funds rate always includes zero. Sorry, the identified set for the impact response of the federal funds rate always includes zero. So these restrictions never rule out the possibility that the federal funds rate does not respond on impact to a monetary policy shock. So we should be worried about this unboundedness problem potentially occurring. So if I go and actually try to uh, approximate the bounds of the identified set for the impulse response to a unit monetary policy shock using some numerical tools, which I won't go into, you just get, you know, like insanely wide bounds. Um, obviously, they're not exact, you know, they're not infinite because we're doing things numerically, but they're very, 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 very wide, um, which suggests that these identified sets are in fact um, unbounded, but obviously we can't say that would certain. Um, but so what would happen if you just went and did standard Bayesian inference in this setting? So this is what I'm gonna, gonna show on this slide. So on the left-hand side, I have the federal funds rate, the impulse response to a unit shock in the federal funds rate. On the right-hand side, I have the impulse response to of output to that shock in the federal funds rate. The uh, blue line is the posterior median and the blue shading represents a 68% credible interval. Um, and this is all under like a, the standard kind of uniform prior on the orthonormal matrix. And so you see that the posterior, well, firstly, the posterior median, looking at that, it suggests that output falls in response to a positive monetary policy shock. I mean, that's consistent with theory. Um, but then we also see the posterior places substantial probability mass on quite large declines in output. You know, there's substantial mass down at like, um, you know, declines exceeding 3% in response to a 100 basis point shock. And so on this basis, you might conclude, well, there's good evidence to suggest that monetary policy is um, potent, right? Um, but what I've just told you is that the identified set for these impulse responses to a unit shock is always unbounded. So the set of posterior means, medians, all the quantiles, robust credible intervals, they're also always unbounded, or it seems like they're always unbounded. So the identifying restrictions tell us absolutely nothing about the impulse response of output to a 100 basis point monetary policy shock. So what you see on this graph, it's purely being driven by the prior, the prior distribution, this uniform distribution, which I would argue is um, fairly arbitrary. That's concerning, I think. If you picked a different prior distribution, you would get different results. And you could pick, you could construct prior distributions that moved these results basically anywhere in the real line. And the important point is because that part of the prior is never updated, you'd never learn that you were wrong. You'd just be getting out basically what you put in. So I think that's quite concerning. Okay, so what do I do now? I take the set of restrictions I just talked to you about and I add some more restrictions. So I add the sign restrictions on impulse responses from Ulig's paper. 
So these restrictions are that in the six months after a monetary policy shock, a positive monetary policy shock, sorry, the federal fund rate does not decrease. Um, so there's no like quick reversals. Uh, and the GDP deflator, commodity prices and non-borrowed reserves don't increase. And so Uli, you know, motivates these restrictions as, you know, trying to disentangle a monetary policy shock from other shocks and including money demand shocks. Um, okay, so if we count up the restrictions, we have two zero restrictions and 27 sign restrictions, so 29 restrictions in total. Clearly the sufficient condition that I wrote down isn't satisfied. And so that means that zero does not necessarily lie within the identified set for the normalizing impulse response, but it might, it still could. Um, and so we need to turn to numerical tools to check whether that's the case, if we're interested in figuring out um, whether the identified set may be unbounded. Um, so I do that and I find that the identified set for the impact response of the federal funds rate includes zero with pretty low posterior probability. So in less than 0.1% of draws, does that identified set include zero? So most of the time, the restrictions rule out the possibility that the federal funds rate doesn't respond to the monetary policy shock, but it still occurs sometimes with low posterior probability. And so because that number is not zero, that means that the set of posterior means will still be unbounded because I'm going to be averaging over something that's unbounded. But the set of posterior medians, you know, sets of posterior quantiles and robust credible intervals, they're all going to be bounded as long as you don't look at extreme kind of quantiles or extreme um, credibility levels. And so on this slide, I've um, sort of plotted the results that we get under these restrictions. So um, the solid blue line and, you know, the blue stuff is basically, you know, the standard Bayesian um, output that I showed you before. Um, the new stuff is, yeah, the, the, the stuff in red, this is the robust Bayesian output. So the solid red lines, they represent the set of posterior medians. So if we fix a particular impulse response, the set of posterior medians contains every possible posterior median that would be consistent with the identifying restrictions um, given the data. And then the dashed lines are like a 68% robust credible interval. And so that's an interval that receives at least 68% posterior probability regardless of the choice of prior. And so if we look at the standard Bayesian output, for the output response on the right hand side. Looking at that, you'd probably conclude that output falls with fairly high posterior probability, right? Like most of the posterior, at least at some horizons, most of the posterior is well below zero. But once we look at the robust Bayesian output, we see that the set of posterior medians and certainly the uh, robust credible interval includes quite large increases in output in response to the shock. So the restrictions appear like they're not super informative about the output effects of a 100 basis point uh, monetary policy shock. And so the choice of prior here, again, is driving in inference to some extent. If we picked a different prior, we could get a posterior, you know, somewhere else in, in, in this region. Okay. And then finally, I combine the two sets of restrictions that I had on the previous slides with some additional so-called narrative restrictions from this paper by Antolin Diaz and Rubia Ramirez in the AAR. So basically the idea behind narrative restrictions is that rather than putting restrictions on the structural parameters, I put restrictions on functions of the structural shocks in particular periods. So for example, I can restrict the signs of structural shocks in particular periods or their contributions to you know, forecast errors in particular periods. Um, so in particular, um, the restrictions are that the monetary policy shock in October 1979 was positive and was the overwhelming contributor to the forecast error in the federal funds rate. So 1979, October 1979, that's when Volcker, you know, jacked up the federal funds rate, you know, widely considered to be an example of a positive monetary policy shock. Um, and this second part of the restriction, that's like a restriction on the historical decomposition. So it's just saying, you know, the shock explained a lot of the variation in the federal funds rate in that period compared to the shocks. So under those restrictions, um, I have to apply some numerical tools to check whether zero with, lies within the identified set for the uh, normalizing impulse response again. Uh, and it turns out that zero never lies within that identified set at any draw of the reduced form posterior. So that suggests that the set of posterior means and all posterior quantiles and robust credible intervals will be bounded. And so I plot the results under that 
um, set of restrictions. Uh, you can see that the, you know, robust credible intervals and set of posterior medians have been um, tightened quite noticeably. So there's a lot of I, sort of, I guess, extra identifying power in that additional restriction. Um, but still, you know, the 68% the robust credible interval is much wider than the sort of standard Bayesian credible interval, which tells you that the prior is still quite important in driving posterior inference. Um, but at least the, the identified set's not unbounded. <laughs> Okay, um, so I compare, you know, I sort of put these estimates that I have here in the paper in the context of existing estimates. Um, so, you know, Ramey has a really fantastic um, handbook chapter that surveys the literature on the um, estimates of the effects of monetary policy and other macro policy shocks or macro shocks. And so she, I guess, kind of tabulates the um, largest output responses to a 100 basis point federal funds rate increase. Um, and they range from like 0.6% to 5%. So like a very large range there. Uh, so under restrictions two and three that I've imposed, um, you could ask the question, what's the posterior probability that output falls by more than 1% after two years? Because I've got a class of posteriors rather than a single one, I get a set of pos posterior probabilities for that event. And so the upper probability, the largest posterior probability of that event is only 5%. So it doesn't matter which conditional prior you choose, you're not going to assign much posterior probability to output falls larger than 1% of the two year horizon. So there's, I interpret that as being, you know, not much evidence of large output effects of, of monetary policy um, in the US and sort of argue that that's consistent with the um, effects lying towards the smaller end of this range of existing estimates. Uh, you might, so an, a question I get fairly often and one that I've thought about a bit, um, so people say, okay, the only reason that this issue crops up is because, you know, you're not ruling out the possibility that, um, you're not ruling out the possibility that, say, the federal funds rate doesn't respond on impact to a monetary policy shock, but, like, come on, we we think that the federal funds rate probably does respond to a monetary policy shock, like, it doesn't really make, make much sense to think otherwise, you know, the Fed can decide to just move the interest rate, and obviously, within the period, it's not then you know, being forced by equilibrium forces to reduce it back to its previous level. So, you know, come on, what are you doing? Um, and so people ask the question, well, can't we just rule out this unboundedness problem by putting some lower bound on the response of the federal funds rate to a monetary policy shock? Or similarly, maybe we could put a lower bound on the contribution of the monetary policy shock to the forecast error variance of the federal funds rate on impact. And I guess the answer to that is, well, yeah, if you were to put such a lower bound, like a um, lower bound on this response, then you're going to for sure rule out this unboundedness problem. But the issue is that it's kind of, in my opinion, difficult to elicit a credible lower bound on that response. Like I ask you, what is the effect of a standard deviation monetary policy shock on impact on the federal funds rate? It's unclear to me where you get that, where can you get a lower bound for that, um, for that parameter and, and be able to defend that credibly? Um, and if you just impose some arbitrary, very small number, so like some, you know, delta, some epsilon kind of lower bound, maybe you say, okay, all I need is for it to be very, very slightly positive. Surely we'd believe that. And that gets rid of the unboundedness problem straight away. But then if the identified sets are unbounded in the absence of that restriction, then the results I get are going to be super, super sensitive to the exact lower bound that I impose. Um, so I talk about that a bit in the paper and sort of illustrate that, um, you know, analytically using this bivariate example. Okay, so um, I'm done, basically. That's all from me. Um, I guess three takeaways. I think it's important to recognize that impulse responses to unit shocks are often what we should be interested in. Again, that's not my point, but I think it's underappreciated. Um, another thing that I think is very underappreciated is that set identifying restrictions may be uninformative about those particular impulse responses in the sense that we learn absolutely nothing about them. I argue it's important for us to transparently communicate about the informativeness of restrictions, for example, by reporting the posterior probability that you know, zero lies within, within the identified set, the normalizing impulse response. And hopefully, hopefully the empirical application has convinced you that this is actually something we should worry about in the sense that there exist very influential sets of identifying restrictions that suffer from this, this problem. Um, and, the other thing, yeah, thanks so much for listening. I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to present today and I'm ha happy to hang around and take questions.
Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, very interesting and innovative piece of uh, research. Um, we are out of time officially, so maybe uh, what we can do is we can end the seminar uh, officially. And if people have questions, uh, I have a few. Uh, then maybe you can hang around and answer questions. Uh, does that sound okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. Excellent, great. So uh, Simon, uh, Sean, maybe can we uh, stop the recording and uh, let people go if they want to? And those of us who have questions can hang around.